What a journey this has been. Looking for proof texts or concepts that prove out <clears throat> whether creationism has the most viable, plausible explanation or evolution. The different forms of creationism and evolution. I go by what the Bible says in a proper reading of it. Uh, we're looking at a massive worldwide volcanic and seismic activity <clears throat> that might have contributed to the worldwide flood, which corroborates the idea of a recent creation, where all of the, the uh, geologic activities, if they evolved over billions of years and we had a worldwide flood, we wouldn't have any record of that. So it must be that the culprit is the worldwide flood itself, which has the full capacity to create all that geological strata, especially since it is not identical everywhere around the world. As a matter of fact, it's radically different very often and repeats itself very often. A lot of water can do this. Okay, let's go to K29. <clears throat> K29.htm. Go to that file. If it prints. There we go. 29.htm. Now it'll go. <clears throat> the massive worldwide volcanic seismic <clears throat> and tidal wave activity is indicated by just looking at the surface of the earth and say, how did this get this way? We can say lots of local floods. Too easy an answer. The difficult answer is it's all put together worldwide because some of the changes are so humongous it would demand a worldwide flood. How do you get to the top of mountain ranges unless you have enough water there? <clears throat> worldwide. You get to the top of, the, of a mountain over here, it's going to be the top of the, the mountain of like height over there. Great volcanic explosions and eruptions are clearly implied in the statement that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up in Genesis 7-11. We're going with this to see if it's plausible. <clears throat> Although I, I love the Bible, I've studied it for more than 30 years and find no error so far. Uh, I'm just using the plausibility of this account because it seems to be the most uh, pervasive, invasive, uh, all covering issue. This must mean that the great quantities of liquids, perhaps liquid rocks or magmas, as well as water, probably steam from the volcanic have been confined under great pressure below the surface rock structure of the earth since the time of its formation, and that this mass now burst forth through great fountains, probably both in the lands and under the seas. <clears throat> By analogy, with present phenomena associated with volcanism, there must also have been great earthquakes and tsunamis, popularly known as tidal waves, generated throughout the world. These eruptions and waves would have augmented the floodwaters as well as accomplished great amounts of geologic work directly and very quickly. <clears throat> there it goes, geologic rock strata. Further inferences from the biblical record of the deluge are that there were great amounts of volcanism and great earth movements both in the early and later stages of the flood period. <clears throat> that these inferences are supported by the field evidence, and at least in a general way, is unquestionable. A great part of the Earth's land surface is covered with material originally ejected from volcanic cones or vents. Never mind all the fossils. Rocks form volcanic action are called igneous, from a Latin term for fire. Without them, no continent would have assumed anything like its present features. During past geologic ages, lava flowed much more freely than now. It not only sprouted from craters, but also pushed upward from immense cracks in the planet's crust. If there were past geological ages, Earth's most stupendous rock formations, stretching for more than thousands of miles along the shores of Canada and Alaska, were squeezed out in such fashion, or maybe the, all the water did it. Oozing lava built great plateaus, which now cover 200,000 square miles in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Northern California. An even larger eruption created India's famous Deccan Plateau, whose once molten rock extends as much as two miles below the surface. 
<clears throat> Argentina, South Africa, and Brazil have similar patterns. So the frame of reference from a biblical record of the deluge, these things occurred quickly. But from a geologic ages point of view, the same result results. So which is more amenable? Which is more plausible? Volcanoes, nature's blast furnaces, science digest. It is significant too that volcanic rocks are found in interbended, are found interbedded with sedimentary rocks of all supposed geologic ages, which would correlate with the biblical implications that the fountains of the great deep continued to pour out their content, contents throughout the entire flood period. In other words, there weren't any geologic ages of hundreds of millions of years. Scripture indicates that the great volcanic earthquake activity began with the 40-day downpour and that it did not cease until the rain ceased. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and this rain from the sky was restrained. So, evidences of past volcanism testifies, testify mainly and gr more greatly to a worldwide flood one time. Because after that, the next flood would erase the evidence of the previous flood. Introduction. Further inferences from the biblical record of the deluge are that there were great amounts of volcanism and great earth movements, both in the early and later stages of the flood period, not throughout geological ages. That these inferences are supported by the field evidence, at least in a general way, is unquestionable. A great part of earth's land surface is covered with material originally ejected from volcanic cones or vents. Okay. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained. It is not only on the land, of course, that evidences of volcanic activity are found. The present status of knowledge of the seafloor in the Pacific Ocean area is such that a surprising amount of evidence of large-scale faulting and mountain building, volcanic activity, and large-scale crustal movements is known. This is a marked departure from earlier assumptions, which, because of lack of information, held that this vast area had been relatively calm during the so-called geologic time and ages. It is well known, of course, Hamilton says, that most of the oceanic islands, both above and below present level, were primarily of volcanic origin. Lots of volcanoes, all at once. The evidence is past volcanism, volcanism Volcanism and cannot be explained by uniformitarianism, which is long ages, gradual process, never changing, always long term and no catastrophic events. A great part of the Earth's surface rocks are igne igneous in origin in many different forms and are often of tremendous extent, sometimes on the surface, sometimes intruded between sedimentary rocks. Forced entry rocks are forced entry of molten igneous rock called magma in a rock formation, sometimes, some, sometimes forming the base of a sedimentary series, which occurred all at once because water comes back and forth, depositing sediments. These igneous rocks are found all over the world in great profusion. Often they are found intruding into previously deposited sedimentary rocks, so much for the aged thing, or on the surface covering vast areas of early periods. The Columbia Plateau of the northwestern United States is a tremendous lava plateau of almost incredible thickness covering about 200,000 square miles. Best explained by a catastrophic event, lots of water. The physiographic history of this province begins with the ancient surface before the lavas were erupted. This is known to have been locally rough, even mountainous, partly by the fact that some of the old peaks rose above the lava flood, which at least was several thousand feet deep. We're presuming geologic ages, or maybe that happened right away. The great shields of the world, notably in this continent, the great Canadian shield, are mainly granites and other igneous rocks. Two million square miles of the great Canadian shield region are covered by so-called so precambian rocks composed in part of a pink granite gneiss that was originally intruded in the form of batholiths during the so-called vast mountain-making upheavals. Batholiths, great subterranean masses of intruded igneous rocks. This could have happened catastrophically much better than over a period of time. Otherwise, we wouldn't have so much intrusion from things that are supposedly of other ages. 
These phenomena are common all over the world and account for a substantial percentage of the Earth's surface rocks. In addition to the intrusive rocks found in every part of the geologic column, they are intrusive because it was catastrophic, not a geologic common over the ages, and the igneous masses underlying the sedimentaries. But the only modern process of, at all pertinent to these phenomena is that of volcanism, which in its present character could not possibly have produced these great igneous formations. There are perhaps 500 active volcanoes in the world, and possibly three times that many extinct volcanoes. But nothing ever seen by man in the present era that can compare with whatever the phenomena were which caused the formation of these tremendous structures. Hello, worldwide flood, volcanic activity, and earthquakes all at once. The principle of uniformity breaks down completely at <clears throat> this important point of geologic interpretation. Some manifestation of catastrophic action alone is sufficient. The catastrophe of worldwide flood. Evidences of path, past earthquake activity testify to a worldwide flood. Introduction. With regard to earth movements, it is likewise common knowledge that the rock formations of the earth exhibit everywhere profound evidence of great tectonic activity, which are movements in the earth's crust. <clears throat> Most of the sedimentary strata, not to mention the still more disturbed igneous and metamorphic rocks, have been tilted, folded, and fo faulted on a tremendous scale, <clears throat> not uniformitarianism. It is extremely interesting in light of the biblical suggestion of uplift of the lands at the conclusion of the deluge period that, to note that most of the present mountain ranges of the world are believed to have been uplifted on the basis of fossil evidence during the so-called Pleistocene to seen and so-called late Pleocene ages. <coughs> Flint makes this fact the basis of his topographical control of continual continental glaciation. Despite the fact that references are scattered and the data have never fully been assembled, the worldwide distribution of these movements is striking. In North America, late Pleocene and Pleistocene movements involving elevations of thousands of feet are recorded in Alaska and the coastal range of Southern California. In Europe, the Scandinavian mountains were created from areas of very moderate relief and altitude in late tertiary time. The Alps were conspicuously uplifted in Pleistocene and late Pleistocene time. Pre. <clears throat> in Asia, there were greatly <coughs> early, great early Pleistocene uplift in Turkestan, the Palmyra, the Caucasians, and the Central Asia generally. Most of the vast uplift of the Himalayas is ascribed to this time. It's ascribed to the latest tertiary and Pleistocene. In South America, the Peruvian Andes rose at least 5,000 feet in post-Pleistocene time. In addition to these tectonic movements, many of the high volcanic cones around the Pacific border in Western and Central Asia and Eastern Africa are believed to have been built up to the present great ice during the Pleistocene and Pleistocene times, the ages. How about just all at once with a lot of wa water? But we have evidence of volcanic activity, nevertheless, which is a better model. I say the worldwide flood. Since the Pleiocene and Pleistocene are supposed to represent the most recent geographical, geological epochs, except that of the present, and since nearly all the great mountain ranges of the world have been found to have fossils from these times near their summits, there is no conclusion possible other than the mountains, and therefore the continents of which they form the backbones, have all been uplifted essentially simultaneously not over the ages, and even according to the evolutionary time scale quite recently. How about a worldwide flood? Surely this fact accords well with the biblical statements of a worldwide flood. Evidence of massive movements in the Earth's crust cannot be explained by uniformitarianism either. Based on predictable rates of erosion, mountain ranges such as the Rocky Mountains should not exist today if you go back millions of years, but they do. <clears throat> Another major geologic phenomenon encountered all over the world is the evidence of tremendous crustal movements that must have occurred in the past. Great thicknesses of rocks have apparently been uplifted thousands of feet. Strata have been buckled, folded, sometimes been thrust laterally and completely overturned on a gigantic scale. A great rocky mountain chain, especially as developed in the southern Rockies, is essentially a series of great folds. In the eastern part of this country, the Appalachian system of mountains is believed to be uplifted an eroded remnant of great geosyncline trough, in so, which a thickness of some 40,000 feet of sedimentary rocks was deposited. Oh, 
Not enough time for that. Maybe it's cataclysmic. Maybe the great white worldwide flood. These